Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the launch of the Tarita Global Report. Nobody helped me. Uh, forced migration and sexual and gender-based violence. I'm Dale Busher. I'm the Vice President for Programs at the Women's Refugee Commission. And please, the rest of you, please introduce yourself in the chat today. Um, as a brief introduction, I'm going to take just a few minutes about to talk about why this matters. And Martin, perhaps you can pull up the, the slides here. Today, there are, as you will see on, on this slide as Martin pulls it up, the next slide, Martin. Um, this, is, this is what we're going to be reviewing today. I'll give you a brief introduction. You'll have some overall findings from Professor Jenny Fillimore, who's led the project. Then we go, we'll go into findings first from transit countries, from Turkey and Tunisia. We'll have some Q&A after each of those sessions, and then we will go into the findings from destination countries, the United Kingdom, Sweden, and Australia. And again, some time for Q&A afterwards. Next slide, Martin. Um, just for a little bit of introduction, why this matters today, as you know, we're dealing with a larger number of the largest number of forced migrants since World War II. In fact, since we prepared this slide, this was pre um, the Ukraine crisis. So there's even more than the, 80, the 82 million listed here. In fact, as you know, there's, a, there's seven plus million who have been displaced in the Ukraine and to neighboring countries alone. What we've seen is the increasing feminization of, my, of forced migration. And again, we see this play out in the Ukraine. We also see the intersectionality of flows. Many more people of diverse gender identities and sexual orientations are now also part of these uh, forced migration flows. What we will be talking about today is how sexual and gender-based violence is multifaceted. We often hear about the interpersonal violence, the domestic violence, the rape, those kinds of things. But we're also going to be talking today about the structural violence, and you'll hear quite a bit of that, especially in some of the, um, in some of the destination countries. This project, which stands for Sexual and Gender-Based Violence from Displacement to Arrival, has been funded by Reichsbanken's Jubilems Fund and Lanson's. And what we will be talking about, and the aim of the project was to look at what is the nature of sexual and gender-based violence faced by forced migrants, and how can protection and support be improved? This project was a joint project from <clears throat> the universities of Birmingham, Melbourne, Bill Kent, and Uppsala with the Women's Refugee Commission and other country-based NGOs. The project is not yet finished. What you are going to be hearing about today are the research findings, but we want those research findings to lead to change in practice and change in policy. We will have short Q&A sessions, and I would encourage you, as the speakers are talking, to put your questions in the chat, and I will be monitoring those as we go through. What I would like to do now is to introduce our first presenter, uh, Professor Jenny Fillimore who is a professor of migration and superdiversity at the University of Birmingham. She's a world leading scholar in refugee integ integration, superdiversity, and access to social welfare with a particular focus on public health. She's also an expert on community sponsorship and she's been the lead on this project. And Jenny is gonna give us an overview of the overall, some of the overall findings of the project. So Jenny Fillimore, over to you, thank you. Thank you, Dale. And Martin, could we have the next slide, please? Um, yeah, thanks for everybody uh, for, for coming today to hear our findings. Just to say, um, you know, this is a, a project that's been running from 2018, um, even into today, actually, we're still undertaking interviews in different areas on different topics. Um, we're going to present um, a flavour of the findings um, from the five main countries in which we've been working. Um, and uh, if you want to, to know more, then you need to look at the, the main report, um, which the links are on, uh, at the end. Uh, so, you know, in the amount of time we've got, we can't really um, present everything to you. Um, now, the, the methods that we use for this project were in-depth interviews. 
And we did these between 2018 and 2021. Um, we've interviewed um, 166 uh, SGBV survivors, gender-based violence survivors, and 107 uh, service providers working with them. And we've mainly interviewed people and uh, organizations working across the uh, MENA and Sub-Saharan African um, regions. And we looked across those two regions because they were the two main flows coming into the countries in which we were working, but also there were different um, triggers, different um, catalysts of people's um, fleeing uh, and different pathways. Uh, that's really important. Um, lots of different ways in which we identified our respondents, but we work very closely with a whole range of NGOs. So in the UK, we work with Doc Doctors of the World, obviously Women's Refugee Commission, Foundation House in, in Australia and, and, and many, many others. We also use snowballing and social media. Now, as you can imagine, this is a, 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 a project on a very sensitive topic. Um, so just to reassure you that there were very extensive um, ethical protocols in place, which looked at um, in enabling the safety of both survivors, but also of the researchers working with them. And all the interviews were undertaken in survivors choice of language, uh, generally by our multilingual researchers, uh, but also by trusted interpreters who were working with the community organisations that we connected with. We've put a, a summary of the sample here, but obviously you're going to need to look at the report to go through that in detail. Next slide, please. Now, one of the first things I want to point out here or, or, or to outline is um, that what we identified was the continuum um, of a gender-based violence sort of spectrum. The, um, the continuum started actually pre-conflict. Um, it continued into conflict um, along people's flight, and in many cases this flight could take multiple years, and it didn't end once people were in what they hoped would be refuge. Um, we have a quote here from one of the representatives that we spoke to in a, a faith-based organisation working with survivors, but basically saying every woman I interviewed said, it's, um, said the story of sexual violence. We hear this over and over and over again. So it's extremely common. And when you put that in the context of the you know, over 90 million people who are currently displaced, you're looking at millions of people. So this is not a small problem. It's not a tiny uh, issue. This is a mainstream problem that needs addressing. In our report, um, you're going to find a, a number of these beautiful um, graphics, which um, were produced for us by Pen Pendonka. And what we've done in these is we've represented the continuum of violence. It's not possible to, for you to read these here and it's not intended, but I just want to show you um, how to use these um, graphics because these tell the stories in a way um, that captures the complexity and the horror of the experience, but without being too horrific. So if you look in the center, you are, you'll see the reason why this um, you know, individual ended up fleeing she had problems, um, her, her family had problems with the police um, and she was raped by a family friend. She was in danger, so she had to leave. And the circle around the outside with all the little flags on it, each of those is the countries that she passed through um, and a note of the experiences she had. So SGB, sexual gender based violence across all those countries um, in her own words. Um, so Penn has taken some of the data that we have and turned it into this illustration. Then at the top panel, um, you see what happens once um, someone's in refuge. This is just one of many um, examples that we can give, uh, but the woman here talks of being treated like an animal because she can't prove what's happened to her. She's asked over 500 um, questions in an interview um, and she doesn't trust the interpreter, so it's very hard for her to disclose what's happened. They're laughing at her uh, and she's crying and she's living in appalling conditions. Um, if we could move to the next slide, please. So um, in our report, we cover a whole range of issues, but there are five main um, concerns that we have that we go into in detail. The first is a lack of services for forced migrants who are on the move. Um, so across those lengthy journeys, which can take weeks, months, or in many cases, years, 
Um, there is no place for forced migrants to turn um, if they experience gender-based violence, if they need food and other resources. The humanitarian and asylum systems encourage violent dependency. So they encourage dependence on people who are violent towards them. That might be human traffickers, it might be people smugglers, it might be uh, encouraging people to enter relationships when they're on the move because they're more protected if they're in a relationship, but then they're uh, abused within that relationship. And once they're in refuge, making people dependent on a lead asylum applicant or a spousal migrant, their um, ability to remain in the country is dependent on them remaining in a relationship. So throughout the immigration, asylum and humanitarian systems, we see this tendency pushing women into violent relationships. We also talk in the report of the traumatic asylum processes that our respondents have gone through, interviews that take hours that are repeated over and over again, um, intrusive, um, unkind and cruel questioning, um, no counselling provided after um, interviews that re-traumatise, expecting people to be interviewed for 10 hours without a break, without any food, having been separated from their children for the first time, waiting months and years. Um, you know, one of our respondents waited or is waiting, it's now 19 years for the outcome of her asylum claim. Um, she is LGBTQI and she's at danger of, of being um, uh, of honour violence if she returns home, but she's being told uh, by the um, immigration services that she needs to prove her sexual identity. We also hear all the way across the humanitarian asylum and immigration systems of unstable and unsafe accommodation. Um, women are entered into refuges for a few months, but then they're thrown out. Um, they are put into mixed gender accommodation in camps, in asylum hostels, um, and uh, they face regular um, threats of, of, of sexual violence and other violence, um, or they simply don't have somewhere to live. They're living on the streets and they're exposed um, to a, a huge amount of risk. Now, the level of service provision depends on the country, and you will hear um, today positive stories as well as negative stories. But on the whole, in many places, there are not enough services and the services that are provided um, lack gender-based violence sensitivity. And um, in the words of the service providers we spoke to, they simply do not have the capacity, they do not have the knowledge, or, and they do not have the, the, the time, and they do not have the funds to deal with the scale of this issue. If we could move to the next slide, please. So um, we've covered in our report some of the health issues around experience of GBV. And you'll see um, at the bottom of this slide, a combination of psychological and physical problems. Uh, many of the respondents we encountered had a mix of these, so multimorbidity, um, experiencing uh, chronic pain alongside um, major psychological disorders. And as I've said, no access to services. Very few of the 166 people we spoke to, and we, as I said, we're still interviewing, and unfortunately nothing's changing, um, have received treatment. Often people are too fearful, they're worried that they'll be detained because um, their, their um, status is irregular. They're worried that they'll be shamed um, for disclosing um, a problem associated with experiencing GBV, or that they'll be charged. They're being refused access to um, basic primary care services in some countries because they can't prove that they are legally in that country, even if they are, perhaps they don't have a, a proof of address, really struggling to disclose what's happened um, to them in short um, medical appointments and with language barriers, often interpreters are from the same community, so they're reluctant to disclose because of the stigma associated with GBV. Healthcare professionals, pro professionals tell us they lack training and they lack knowledge um, and they're under such extreme time pressures. They don't have the months and sometimes years that it takes to build up trust in order to um, encourage people to disclose so that they can then seek the treatment that they need. And one of the problems across the project, wherever you look, 
is the complex nature of these cumulative experiences. So our systems and our medical um, services are set up around the idea of people experiencing one traumatic incident. That's not what we're seeing. We're seeing multiple incidents, cumulative trauma, long histories of abuse that um, don't fit into our existing recording um, mechanisms, but don't fit into our recovery mechanisms. We don't have the services we need that people need in order to help them to recover. This is highly specialist work and it's something that countries of transit and countries of refuge are not heavily invested in. And our final, or my final slide, please. Um, now, in the report, you will see a wide range of recommendations. Uh, these are not things that we have just, um, you know, pulled out of the air. Um, we have um, consulta uh, consult consulted, sorry, it's early-ish in the morning. Um, we've consulted widely with humanitarian agencies, with governments and with some funders about the, the nature of these, um, the, the, these recommendations. We've also heard from survivors and service providers about what needs to change. So in the report, you'll see that there are roles for a, a wide range of stakeholders. Um, in, in general, in the general principles, what we're asking for is a combination of the mainstreaming of forced migration, gender and traumatic um, uh, and trauma sensitive SGB approaches, but also um, some specialist services. So we need the development of forced migrant sensitive programs with appropriate actions to address um, sexual and gender based violence as it occurs along forced migration routes at hotspots and at um, crucial points like border crossings. Um, so we want to see increased funding for mobile delivery of services. People are on the move. These, um, you know, that they're experiencing SGBV on the move, and that's where those services need to be in the humanitarian sector. But once we get to countries of refuge, we need gender sensitive reception and asylum procedures. Um, so we need to look at how we can improve asylum and immigration systems so that they protect um, survivors from further harm and from further traumatization. And we need to build the capacity to deal with a complex trauma that I, I advise to you is, is going on, um, unfortunately, is a regular factor, is, a, is the norm to some extent within forced migration. Okay, so um, I'll look forward to some questions in a bit, but for now, I think Dale, it's back to you. Thank you so much, Jenny, for that really comprehensive overview and those really stark um, but important findings. Uh, as a reminder, for those of you who joined us a little bit later, please introduce yourselves in the chat and put any questions you have in the, in the Q&A function. I do have one question in here already, Jenny, for you. Um, the question is, since this is a very sensitive subject, how did you approach possible participants and how did you present your research? I imagine you could not present your research as a study on SGBV, so how did you deal with this? This comes from Lene. I realize I've unmuted myself. Um, so we worked very closely with lots and lots of NGOs um, and the NGOs had built trusting relationships with um, survivors and we ourselves have long term relationships with these organizations who know that we work in a very careful and ethical way. So in on the whole, what we did is we um, access people via the um, NGOs and then um, they explained our research. Um, and then when we were put in contact with those people, we again explained what we were doing, um, um, you know, the, the, the areas that, that would be covered. Um, so I'll say that in brief, because I think we need to move on to um, our um, Turkish uh, 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 presentation now, and I'll maybe respond in the next question and answer session, if there's any more questions for me. Yes, thanks, Jenny. We will move on. We're going to hear next from, from our countries of transit. So we're going to hear first from Turkey. Um, so we're going to hear specifically from Dr. Saini Um Dr. Akurumez is Associate Professor at the Department of Political Science and Public Administration at, at Bill Kent University. She is the founding director of Human Mobility Processes and Interactions Research Lab at the Faculty of 
Economic Administration and Social Sciences at Bilkins University. So, Saime, over to you. Thank you very much, Dale. Um, as, as Jenny has mentioned, I'm going to try to um, give us ideas about what we have found as a snapshot. Uh, can we go to the next slide, Martin? Yes. Um, I think when we're trying to study Turkey, one of the most distinguishing factors would be to set the context of forced migration. And uh, three factors seem to be very important here. Compared to the other countries we have studied, uh, in Turkey, we had a population of forcibly displaced migrants mainly from Syria amounting to 3.6 million and more and other countries and uh, this particular population also has a considerable uh, group which were vulnerable and as, as Jenny has mentioned has been experiencing multiple vulnerabilities. Uh, the other point that we would like to raise here is Turkey has heavily received with an open door policy uh, an increasing flow of migration from Syria uh, who were forcibly displaced and con um, escaping conflict and continuously is doing so. And very recently, the borders have been closed, but they're already here. And the other issue is about the context in Turkey. Uh, in Turkey, the context has responded with a legal framework in 2013 with the law on foreigners and international protection. And to the mass influx, it has responded with a regulation on temporary protection. So these two legal frameworks set the background for the institutional arrangements and regulations that would govern the uh, however, there were a couple of uh, dilemmas in this context, one of them being temporary protection, that is the status of temporariness, and because Turkey has already applied a geographical limitation, these individuals would not be recognized as refugees, but, but would remain temporary. Uh, and the second dilemma is that the scale is actually involving many actors, public authorities, uh, the very recently named Presidency of Migration Management, but alongside NGOs, INGOs, and municipalities. Uh, can you go to the next slide, Martin. Um, in terms of uh, the two questions that I thought we could actually uh, talk about in this particular uh, sharing of knowledge that we have been able to compare with other countries, one of the most important is why are vulnerabilities so persistent? Because the case of Turkey is actually frequently highlighted as a success case compared to other uh, countries of refuge uh, in the region and who are receiving mass influx as well. One of the responses could be given about the policies, the legal framework and governance. The first First one is actually speaking back to what I just mentioned. There is a lot of uncertainty in terms of principles because of temporariness. And in Turkey, there has been also a transition from accommodation and camps to cities. Now, most of the uh, force of the displaced uh, Syrians, the, they're also called Syrians under temporary protection, are living in the cities. And although there have been very innovative collaboration processes around GBV as well in the cities, there is also a question of sustainability because most of these in initiatives are going around projects. Therefore, we have observed a lot of interventions that are, were aimed at protection, prevention, knowledge sharing. Uh, however, they, most of the actors lacked clear mandates and commitments, uh, which, question, which had questions around sustainability. And most of the time, when we had tried to observe the data that has been collected, we have also observed that there were gaps in data collection, the management of data, and use for uh, actual experiences for the future. The service providers' perspectives and also survivors' perspectives also uh, matched these particular concerns. And there were gaps in between needs and services for two reasons. Number one, the needs and services in protection space when they had first arrived in the first number of years. And also as, as long as they stayed here, the uh, prolonged stay, they had changed over time. Can we change the slides? Uh, the second had to do with the interventions that we have observed. There were a plethora of interventions, but as Jenny has already mentioned for the whole project, there is, a, uh, there is much need to have a trauma sensitive policy uh, design and implementation. We have observed that municipalities, INGOs, NGOs, uh, public authorities, and volunteers were already in, in the field trying to provide particular awareness raising activities, psychosocial support, sometimes language training as well. However, they were not actually amounting to a particular comprehensive approach that the context seemed to need and sustain. The other issue was around the conceptualization of SGBB. 
encountered service providers who had actually been discussing still the concept. And one of the major matters here was that physical violence was particularly recognized by the, the survivors. However, other forms of violence still needed to be recognized by both service providers and survivors to be uh, actually acted upon. So what we have observed is uh, the financial support and safe spaces seem to be standing out. And by safe space, we're not only referring to a particular space location, um, a, a house, but also safe spaces where actually survivors and service providers are in interactions of trust with each other, because this has also a very important disclosure and afterwards action taking um, step for these contexts. Can we change the slides? And the second question is, who survives and how and why in these kinds of contexts? Uh, there are very important matters that we need to highlight from the stories and narratives uh, that were extremely touching from the survivors' perspectives. Mothers actually have been uh, trying to survive and promote their resilience strategies even further. Uh, we have also observed that belief has served as a source of resilience. And we have also observed that the more severe the SGBV experience, throughout the journey, the more resilient the survivors had become and they had tried to make sure that they were able to survive in the new context that they have arrived. And another point is that particularly surviving in social networks, not only among their own communities, but also within local communities had been very striking factors that had helped them uh, survive the experiences of SGBV that were particularly continuous throughout the journey. And uh, coping with discrimination came out as another important factor because as Jenny has mentioned, there is an interest in the context of uh, SGBV experience and coping with many different forms of discrimination in everyday life became an important strategy for everyone to actually survive these contexts. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, well, as we have thought about what kind of solutions and what kind of policy principles could actually help out come up with uh, particularly sustainable uh, policy designs for these contexts, we have actually come across a very important um, um, solution uh, that we could support. One of them is that there's already a need to com combat structural violence and interpersonal violence at the same time. And this means that multiple vulnerabilities that originate from interactions that are discriminatory as well as economic uh, discrimination and so on need to be really accompanied by recognition of interpersonal violence from which the survivors would need to be taken out of or actually provided with resilience strategies. Uh, the other one is about a comprehensive approach and by comprehensive we refer to a combination of service provision that is with refugees not only for refugees takes into account psychosocial support as at the center of particularly empowering these individuals and recognizing the violence that they have been perpetrated and also trying to become resilient against it. And also actually providing legal support to be able to survive uh, the accruing principles such as trying to get out of a marriage that is abusive or trying to get out of particular contexts that are continuing to be uh, challenging for themselves. And safe accommodation, I could not stress this more, particularly for the context of forced migration. Thank you very much. I may thank you so much for that presentation and thank you for highlighting the, the role that trauma plays in the lives of survivors, but also that resilience plays and for really highlighting also the interconnectedness between structural violence and interpersonal violence. We're gonna move on to the other transit country that we talked about um, in, the, in the research. And this will be presented by Dr. Sandra Pertek uh, from the University of Birmingham. Uh, Dr. Pertek is a Sarita Research Fellow and a Gender Specialist with expertise in faith and gender-based violence and over a decade's experience in international development and migration. As a reminder, we will take some time for questions at the end of this presentation, really focusing on some of the findings and learnings from the transit country. So please put your questions in the Q&A. Sandra, over to you. Thank you so much, Dale. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening. Um, so I'll begin from the next slide um, with a little background. Uh, Tunisia became a hotspot and diversion route for migrants seeking, seeking to reach Europe, 
We know there is an ongoing Mediterranean tragedy. Almost 24,000 people, migrants, are missing since 2014. These uh, people mainly are missing in the central Mediterranean route. And Tunisia is often described as a mixed migration, mixed movement there, uh, setting. There are people with various migration statuses, being their countries for different circumstances and migrant and refugee responses in Tunisia in overall can be described as underfunded and under-resourced and only a few international agencies actually operate in the area. Survivors who I met uh, have been living in limbo for months or years for many, Tunisia was a transit country, temporary refuge and settlement where humanitarian assistance was sometimes available to them, but they had no possibility to gain permanent settlement. Long refugee procedures and waiting times for a settlement made them live in limbo. And there was urgent medical assistance accessible, but there was no lack of livelihood and housing support. That's an overview of the background. And in the next slide, I will go straight into the experiences of survivors. So, First of all, I need to highlight that all respondents, respondents were subjected to the continuum of violence across different stages of migration. Individual survivors faced multiple incidents over, of violence over time and place, a place multiple times. It's not just one time. 13 women, for example, in my sample experienced sexual violence in transit in Libya. Eight were trafficked and enslaved. I spoken to 15 survivors overall in, in Southern Tunisia, in Medin and Jerzys, for your information. And one mainstream service provider said that almost all, he quoted around 90% of women migrants arriving to Tunisia were raped or abused in Libya or during their journeys. Well, SGBB was later, some women told me about witnessing other, survive, of other victims dying in detention centers in Libya, that was quite common. Some women often were forced to, to sexual relations at gunpoint some respondents had witnessed other migrant women dying from sexual exploitation. Um, These experiences point to the violent interface between gender-based violence, trafficking, and restrictive asylum systems. Most of the survivors I uh, met, interviewed, told me that they felt they were subjected to violence because of their um, well, legal status, because they were migrants. Regarded, it was not much about their, their looks, their ethnicity or religion, it was just about who, who they were as migrants because they were illegal in the countries where they were transiting. In the next slide, I will continue a description of this continuum of violence. There was, a what came out strongly is that forced migrant journey itself often became for many survivors a form of violence with numerous, numerous incidents of gender-based violence perpetrated by various actors. International agreement at time, well, if we go deep further into this, what we can, um, what comes out strongly is that international agreements aimed at strengthening the borders and detention centers in Libya, for mainly prolonged respondents' journeys and increased their vulnerabilities, taking more dangerous crossings and relying on smugglers. So, these undignified and risky journeys were defined by respondents as a form of violence against women. And um, for some survivors, these experiences became grounds for their refugee claims. Uh, well, overall, as you may imagine, respondents reported severe psychological distress due to multiple experiences and witnessing severe exploitation. In the next slide, I will go a little bit further into vulnerability factors, why women were subjected to these experiences. So there's a range of interpersonal, contextual, situational factors that contributed to the vulnerability and exposure to violence. Limited protection on the move, first of all, then the lack of sufficient legal routes, border crossing, borders being closed, delayed settlement, resettlement procedures, and, and hostile immigration environments are some of the underlying structural issues that contributed to, to this experience, to shaping these experiences. And as I mentioned, being a migrant was a central vulnerability. So vulnerability. In terms of slow violence, what we what could be described, what happened in Tunisia to those people I met was exposure to indirect violence, um, making people basically barely living. Most vulnerable migrants, although they could access shelter for limited times uh, provided by international organizations, vouchers that they received were below poverty line. There was no right to work. They relied on insecure and informal work facing discrimination and exploitation. Some victims rented privately and but they often depended on the charity of neighbors to eat and pay the rent. 
Uh, those granted refugee status waited years for to be resettled, leaving them to leave in the leaving them in destitution and with little chance to recover from the tra sexual traumas that they experienced during their journeys. In terms of violence of uncertainty, uh, it could, what happens to these people could be described as violence of uncertainty. Lengthy asylum procedures not only generated uncertainty and put the lives of refugee applicants on hold, but pushed people to take additional risks. Some gave up waiting and migrated onwards towards Europe via risky sea crossings and with additional risks of, risks of violence and risk of repeated victimization. In the early COVID-19 pandemic conditions, resettlement assessments were completely halted, which led to many intensified feelings of hopelessness and anxiety. And there was also this um, phenomenon of deception where women and adolescent girls traveling alone were tricked into fake marriages with men met in Libya, for example, as they were told that marriage would increase the likelihood, likelihood, likelihood of resettlement. Um, in the next slide, I will focus on the resilience. Uh, although people are some, subjected to multiple forms of violence, they display, exhibit incredible levels of resilience to survive and, well, cope with the experiences faced. Women I interviewed relied on their own available means of coping in situations of lack of support and all the different structural issues that they faced. They believe system, inner strength, and social emotional resources were described as key coping resources. Um, this were basically religion, faith, also personal qualities and inner strength that kept women going. And life lessons from their parents, or basically maintaining contact with family for, for minority was, was, a life, was a lifeline to continue to. Many desired to ensure a better future for their children and that kept them going too. Um, so respondents entrusted Going a little bit further into this religious coping mechanisms, basically respondents entrusted their lives to God and with ultimate faith, and they were sometimes encouraged to take extra risks to cross again the sea to continue their journey, while they further protected and empowered to continue. Uh, these findings are consistent with wider literature on migrant resilience, evidencing the importance of religion in resilience and everyday coping of African forced migrants. And most respondents drew strength from their faith to continue their trajectories towards desired destinations, but, but adapted this um, religious practices according to changing circumstances of migration. For example, in detention and forced prostitution, allowed prayers transformed into silent prayers. And um, from some spiritual struggles emerged. One survivor, for example, quoted on the slide. She felt abandoned and forgotten by God and because her asylum claim was refused multiple, multiple times, but she kept holding out on hope and drew strength from her faith. Most respondents were people of faith who spoke about unmet religious needs, but there was limited psychological and spiritual support to help resolve spiritual tensions that emerged um, among respondents. Um, yeah, so in the last slide, just to end, I would like to share a comic, encourage you to, to review a comic of one survivor, demonstrating one story of survivor. I will put it in the chat box. And I wanted to highlight two recommendations. First, first recognize this HGBV related trauma during forced migrant journeys and offer mobile mental health and psychosocial support to survivors to enable their healing early. And the second relates to economic opportunities and to support self-reliance and reduction of aid dependency to reduce vulnerabilities to SGBV. Thank you very much. I will end here. Over to you, Dale. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Sandra. And I really appreciate that you brought up, you know, two countries that we don't actually hear a lot of research about, Libya and Tunisia as transit countries. So I think that really adds to this conversation. I also really appreciated your highlighting the, the violence of uncertainty and how that interplays with trauma and what we're, you know, what we're subjecting individuals to in their lives by these endless years of uncertainty and the impact that has. But I also appreciate you focusing on those sources of resilience. I don't think in our response programs, we think enough about what are those coping mechanisms and how do we build those coping mechanisms? 
So we're gonna take a few minutes now for, for question and answers before we move into some of the findings from the destination countries. Please put your questions in the Q&A um, and I will come to those, but maybe I will just kick it off to both uh, Sandra and Saime to say, you know, you both talked about resilience and certainly in my in in the work and the research that I've done, I've seen, like in refugee camps and refugee settings, this incredible resilience while people are struggling to meet their basic needs because they have no choice, right? It's they're so focused on what I need to do today to survive. But then once we get beyond the basic needs, that's when you start seeing the trauma really impacting their ability to move forward with their lives. And I wonder if, if you had um, any thoughts about that, anything to add about that, um, I'd, love, I'd love to hear from you. Thank you. Um, I could jump in immediately, uh, Dale. Okay, uh, so I think um, we have been able to observe uh, very critical interventions that were very useful, particularly with the NGOs. Um, our survivors had accounts of educations and trainings that really helped them, uh, not only because of what they have become aware of, but also um, our highlight on safe spaces. That is a place to go, a place to be heard. Uh, that seemed to be a very important intervention in terms of promoting their resilience. And uh, I would like to really reiterate one of the points you have raised, uh, that particularly recognizing trauma and trying to heal uh, the wounds of that trauma on a continuous basis, basis with, a, with, so, with a social support network uh, seems to be very important. And Increasingly, forced migration contexts are trying to focus on livelihood creation, but from our observations, I think first focusing on the individual's ability to enhance her well-being and resilience will actually uh, lead a better way towards integration and also self-reliance through livelihood creation. Thank you. Well, I will jump just a few sentences on that. Well, that's a very pertinent observation. People continue for long during their journeys you know, on a survival mode. They, they are doing anything to survive, basically holding to the, whatever keeps them going, the belief system and so on. But what we've heard from the respondents um, in countries of arrival, the countries of refuge is that, one, that Upon arrival, when you are supposed to be already in a safe country, this the asylum procedures and the immigration system is making people just crash down, uh, if I may define it like that. Um, so they are resilient to the point of arrival and upon arrival, the level of procedures and discrimination is just uh, beyond, it's just exceeding the resilience limits. But that's, yes, that's what we heard from some service providers. Obviously, there are various resilience capacities among different people, and there are different ways that keep people going. There's a range of different techniques. What would be important for service providers and the governments to recognize would be to um, enable people to utilize their coping mechanisms. People cope best drawing on their known strategies. So if this is faith, to enable them to access their, um, I don't know, faith institutions, religious spaces, that's one. But building on, on, on what Stamey said, yes, creating safe spaces is essential for, for women, for, for, for LGBTQI community. Um, yes, these are spaces where people are able to build social connections and that's essential for resilience building. And yes, I also would like to echo what Stamey said about livelihoods that yes, economic opportunities are essential to help people be resilient and well, to continue their resilience, to, to strengthen their resilience, basically, um, it's the key to enable people to work. People wanted to work, they, can, they can't, they don't want to not do anything, they want to work and study, but often they are not allowed. Thank you. Thank you, Simon and Sandra. I have three quick questions for you, and then we're going to move on to the destination countries, and there will be opportunities for more questions after that. If, and I'll ask all of these and you can just respond as you're able to them. One is uh, from Anissa, she works on SGBB in, a, in Algeria and she says access to survivors is a real problem. So maybe you could 
talk about that. We have another question from Batamlak in Ethiopia who says, but how have women regained from their, you know, re, re, uh, recovered, I guess, from their psychological traumas and how could religious leaders help? Um, can you share an experience with us? And finally, from, from Michelle, we have, um, would you be able to offer such support to individuals who needed psychological support on the back of your interviews? So for those you interviewed, were there referral pathways, whatever, and have you been able to follow any participants up uh, on their journey, follow them through their journey and after their journey? So very quickly over to, to Sandra and Saime on these. I could jump in, Sandra, or would you like to go first? I'll go. go ahead. Okay, all right. Um, the first question, access to survivors. Um, I think uh, we are owing a lot to our NGO partner. Uh, so on that account, we have been able to access survivors uh, through their networks. So that had been extremely uh, helpful for us. And in terms of the psychosocial support, uh, NGOs have been uh, actually a, a applying already a lot of psychosocial support services that were either based on case management or group work. And when we had encountered situations whereby uh, we had thought there would be further a requirement of maybe a support, then we would inform our NGO partners as well, because as researchers, we had to keep a certain objective uh, sort of distance between our work and, and how we would be uh, able to intervene in terms of the uh, survivors that we had interviewed. Saimi, and yes, we had um, very thorough um, referral procedures in place as part of our ethical procedures. So we were referring survivors up after the interviews, those who were in need of referrals, we would provide them a list of services that they could access and follow up whether they accessed. Um, so definitely pathways to referrals is essential conducting such sensitive interviews and engaging in this kind of line of work. And oh yes, um, people recover through developments in different areas of their well-being. So lots of different areas needs to be matched to, to, to help people progress when it comes to spiritual leaders. Um, I have an example of one survivor from Tunisia who reached out to a, to a, relig a religious leader online and he gave her a reassurance that given that she was raped multiple, raped multiple times, she will be still able to marry and that she shouldn't be concerned and just focus on her future. This was life-changing for her, I believe, it helped her to move forward. It's absolutely essential to enable people to access um, of people of authority that can advise them, that matter to them. Um, people can recover yeah, through the social connection, building social connections and uh, spiritual leaders should do much more to reach out to survivors on the move. There was lack of access to pastoral care across the journeys and upon the arrived countries of refuge of transit countries like at the basis of Tunisia. Access to survivors that Anissa was asking about. Um, certainly, there are massive barriers, uh, linguistic, structural barriers. We should do our best to develop materials in native languages to, to allow people to access services. Um, yeah, we don't have much time to go into it. We need to move on. So maybe we can reach out bilaterally, Anissa, if you like. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sandra and Simon. We, Hannah, I do see your question. Please hold that question. We will have another QA session at the end, but now I need to move us on to the hearing from the countries of destination. And we're gonna start with the UK, um, Jenny Fillimore again, um, who has already been introduced, but also Lisa Goodson, who is a lecturer at the Department of Social Policy, Sociology and Criminology, uh, where she coordinates the social policy research models at the postgraduate level, as well as teaching and tutoring undergraduate models, um, modules in new migration at the University of Birmingham. So Lisa and Jenny, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dion. Um, hi, everyone, and thank you for coming um, today and for your interest in the project. Now, what we've seen across the Sarita project is the way in which um, SGBV was evidence at different stages of forced migration and along this continuum of violence. In the UK context, I want to pick up on three main ways in which 
the system interacted with SGBV, and Jenny's all, already touched upon this, the, um, the way in which um, it encourages violent dependency, the impact of traumatic asylum pr um, processes, and the um, effect of unstable and risky um, housing. So first of all, um, immigration and asylum policies and practices were commonly referred to by participants as being um, harmful and uh, very damaging, both by victims and um, service providers. And we heard accounts of how the immigration and encounters with the immigration um, system exacerbated um, trauma, would lead to new trauma, and in some ways, um, increase victims' vulnerability to experiencing further SGBV. And I'll, I'll, I'll share some examples of um, how this occurs. So in particular, the lengthy waits um, around decision-making on their asylum claims. So this notion, um, this, this kind of situation of being in, in limbo, the inability to work, uh, inability to study, really um, proved to exacerbate survivors um, psychological distress um, without having that lack of day-to-day -day distraction um, it really did impact on um, survivors uh, mental well-being um, in the, the fear of living um, and being returned to um, persecution so that you know the the, the problem of um, living with uncertainty and I'll speak a little bit more about um, how living with uncertainty can be helped in some um, situations um, later on in the presentation. Also, the, the kind of shift of moving um, in and out of systems, being kind of refused asylum, um, having to kind of then create new appeals, um, often led to them being in and out of situations of um, destitution, which again led to their, um, their well-being and increased their well-being well-being being undermined, but also increased risks of um, further sexual and gender-based violence. We heard lots of stories where um, women in particular had experienced gender insensitive asylum interviews with male caseworkers and male interpreters, which um, in many ways led victims to um, be fearful of disclosing their SGBV experiences. Um, and there were particular groups of people that we spoke to, in particular LGBTQI um, participants that reported increased risks of um, vulnerability and discrimination through the asylum um, interview and the um, asylum process. In terms of um, the way in which systems encourage violent dependency. Our research demonstrated that forced migrant women in particular who arrived in the UK with a spous spousal visa had no recourse to public funds. This means that they had um, they were completely dependent on their um, spouse um, and many often lived with the threat of deportation if there were problems within the marriage. So it was common that many women were frightened to um, report incidents of interpersonal uh, violence, intimate partner violence. Um, and if they did, it would mean that they would be left with no recourse to public funds, which meant that they had very, very few housing and support options um, open to them. And many spoke of how this led to further exploitation by strangers, but also in some cases by friends. <laughs> now, refused asylum seekers not in rece um, receipt of housing and support, again, relied on exploitative relationships for survival and um, incidents where engaging in transactional sex um, for survival was um, common for a number of the um, participants that we spoke to. Um, LGBTQI participants, for example, um, said that they relied heavily on tra transactional sex for survival. Um, so what we see really is that without support and social connections, um, many survivors get trapped 
into exploitative relationships um, in order to access basic necessities. And this is not just along the refugee journey, but also um, in, in resettlement in countries of um, destination and refuge. <clears throat> okay, thirdly, I just want to touch on the, um, the way in which housing, um, inappropriate housing actually compounds trauma. Um, given that many of the um, survivors that we spoke to had experienced SGBV at the hands of men, being housed in gender accommodation was problematic and completely um, inappropriate for women and, um, in, in, and children. Um, a number of participants spoke of how bathrooms and um, bedrooms had no locks, um, how they would live with abusive staff who would walk in unannounced, um, and incidents of sexual um, harassment in, in, the, in the accommodation where they'd been placed. So in the UK, the, um, the asylum dispersal system and the way in which um, survivors can be dispersed and redispersed away from support networks, again, was another way in which um, individual psychological well-being was undermined. It, the, the, the importance of the connections with friends connections with um, NGOs, which I'll speak about um, a little bit more um, shortly, and healthcare providers was absolutely um, paramount. Um, again, particular issues around LBGTQI individuals and victims um, from Muslim backgrounds reported feeling particular stigmatization and discrimination both in their communities, but also in the accommodation that they'd been um, dispersed to. And for those that have come through the asylum um, system and received leave, leave to remain, they've got 28 days to quit their accommodation. Um, many we found were waiting long waits for um, welfare payments, universal credit, and again, this meant that many moved in and out of destitution repeatedly um, and left them um, in a state where they're vulnerable to further exploitation and, and violence. So that kind of summarises the way in which um, SGBV intersects with the system, particularly in the UK, but um, there are also other similarities across other destination countries, which you will hear about um, shortly. I just want to move on now to the next slide to just emphasise the role of NGOs. Now, we found that civil society organisations played a very important role in the resettlement process and also in terms of building resilience and assisting um, with integration, as Sime and, and Sandra has um, um, have already touched upon. So, you know, this was a way that survivors could tap into a whole range of different um, support services from legal housing, health services, through to wellbeing um, support, through to kind of uh, social events, which were particularly um, success, su successful in helping survivors um, able to cope, particularly in moments of crisis. Women particularly spoke of how these kind of interactions help them regain their confidence and um, create a sense of security and stability. So it's this opportunity to come together as part of an organised group or through a drop-in session that's um, available through NGOs that reduces the isolation, creates new friendships and networks, um, which some actually describe as being a lifeline. Um, so the feelings of solidarity and, and, and safe space, as Simon's already touched upon, is absolutely um, invaluable for survival, survivors' well-being. Those um, survivors that didn't, uh, that weren't tapped into or didn't have connections with civil society organisations were left alone and their problems, with their problems, and they tended to um, be extremely isolated and some talked about um, suicidal ideations or attempts at suicide. Um, again, very important um, role that civil society organisations play in terms of offering ESOL provision um, and of course with English language in the UK proficiency in English language is essential in being able to interact with other people um, and also a way to move on and um, secure 
employment opportunities when when uh, people are granted the, the uh, right to work. However, these relationships with NGOs didn't happen overnight. Um, many, civil society organisations spent many months building trust and confidence and um, before survivors were willing to um, speak out. So, yes, I just want to kind of emphasise the role of NGOs and then I'll just share with you the final slide that touches on the recommendations, which I'll just leave with you. And these are detailed in the UK Sarida report. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa. And thank you for, you know, there's always been this assumption that when refugees and migrants arrive in a country of destination and get into an asylum or resettlement process that they have reached safety. So I think it's really critical that you're highlighting that our systems actually perpetuate structural violence through our asylum processes and the availability of assistance and the level of assistance that is provided to them. So thank you for sharing that. We're gonna move on now to Sweden to hear about another destination country and, and Hannah Bradby will be presenting. She is a professor at the sociology department at Uppsala University in Sweden where she has been since 2013 her research interrogates the links between identity, structure, and health, with particular reference to racism, ethnicity, and religion. So, Hannah, over to you. Thank you very much, Dale, and greetings to everybody who's in this virtual space. Um, yes, I, I want to pick up the uh, ideas that we've heard a certain amount about already, uh, about the structural influences that people experience. Uh, we know from, especially from what we've heard already, that this is a serious problem that damages people and their relationships and their abilities to contribute to society. Um, but the ways in which that damage that happens at personal individual level interact with the context is one of the things that's come out of our research and it's been mentioned already. So the Swedish context, as you probably all know, it's a place that has, until 2015 anyway, had a very generous policy towards refugees and has a reputation for that worldwide. It's also a place that since 2017 has had a 10-year strategy for combating men's violence against women. So it's a place where at uh, official level, a particular form of gender-based violence has very much been at the heart of policy making. So in that respect, it was no great surprise when we asked service providers about how they defined, conceptualized, worked with definitions of gendered violence, we got a number of different responses. We got uh, responses around the Istanbul Convention. We got responses around the Norwegian uh, therapist and activist, Per Istar. Uh, his definition was offered. But we also had people who said, no, no, we don't really work with definitions at all. We just do the work. So that, there was a real range of responses there. But one response that came up quite often particularly when talking with people who had a lot of contact with refugees, uh, is this first quote that's on the slide that you can see from someone who worked in a women's shelter, who said, it's not very common to talk about sexual and gender-based violence. I would say to use the term gender-based violence, that's not common because we usually talk about men's violence against women. So that effect of having a national policy that was very much about men's violence against women in contexts where uh, refugees had a different experience of violence uh, was visible. One of the positive effects of there having been long-standing work in this area in Sweden is that when we talk to service providers, then many different groups of people were named. So it wasn't limited, for instance, to straight cis women. People talked about that, of course, forced sex with husbands being a problem, torture and stranger rape being a problem. But they also talked about young men, boys from Afghanistan and from Iran who had arrived in large numbers in 2015 in particular. Also LGBTQI people, Roma, 
single mothers from Eritrea. So there are a range of different groups who were identified as being vulnerable. Um, now, another heading that came up quite often was the idea of honour violence. So uh, a women's organisation advisor said, I mean, you know, you have migrants who are coming from honour cultures who are also facing gender based violence. This is females largely. So this heading of honour based violence was quite uh, regularly coming up in our interviews and is named, in fact, in the uh, 10 year strategy that I mentioned already. In some ways, this made uh, violence amongst migrants and refugees visible, but in other ways, it was a controversial and contested idea because for some uh, service providers who themselves had a migrant or a forced migrant background, they felt that the term honor based violence was used to dismiss violence that happened amongst people who had a, a refugee background and to imply that it was different from kind of normal domestic violence, normal violence between intimate partners. And there was a kind of bifurcation of the um, both the priority it was given in terms of resources, but also the sorts of solutions that were offered. And that was problematic. So that's an area that um, that, that came out that we weren't necessarily anticipating. Can I have the next slide, please, Martin? Thank you. So the Swedish migration context is one uh, aspect of the, the structure that was really crucial. Um, just before our study started, uh, migration had been a, a, an enormous political issue in Sweden as in other parts of Europe. So people talked about this politicized nature of migration and how refugees were being divided into uh, real refugees, people who are really in distress and so-called economic migrants. Now, whether this division is appropriate or not uh, is a debate for another time. So one of the NGO representatives we talked to said that migration is so politicized that and it had got too much muddled up for them with political ideology. So they felt that it was time to look at the human being in front of you, but, but that the focus was constantly on how to defend and protect an individual and to make sense of why they were allowed to be in Sweden at all, which made it very difficult to do violence protection work. Uh, because there was a large number of arrivals in 2015 to Sweden and the migration agency had a very slow pace of uh, processing applications for residency, we could see very clearly in both uh, what forced migrants themselves said and what service providers for them said, the effect of this on people's attempts to get better from the complex trauma that they had uh, experienced. So in particular, um, the ways in which migration is governed at, at state level at the, the level of national policy got in the way of protecting people from gender-based violence. So there were uh, initiatives that gave people a better opportunity for family reunion. But of course, if that family to which one was being reunited involved some violence, then that put at risk one's possibility of gaining residence. So someone in an honor based violence project at the municipal level, at the local level, said young women who come to Sweden by family reunion cannot file a complaint because if they got divorced, they'd lose their right to have a residency. And this uh, difficulty is further compounded because intimate partner violence, as it's usually known in the Nordic context, is not grounds for asylum although having suffered violence as a result of one's gender and sexual identity is grounds for asylum. So there's this kind of loophole. So in a women's NGO, one of the advisors told us, uh, one can prove that if they are persecuted because of their sexuality, then yes, it becomes grounds for asylum, but not like domestic violence. So that was a difficulty that we found evidence for. Can I have the next slide, please? So, of course, we were very interested in uh, how to pr how uh, 
recovery uh, amongst survivors was being impeded or promoted. And as has already been mentioned, dependence on an abusive spouse for who, with partnership with whom one's residency depended upon was a problem. And as already mentioned, long waiting times for migration was a real problem for people's ability to keep up their sense of hope in their possibility for recovery. So those were identified very clearly in quotes with uh, forced migrant women in this case. Okay, I'll move on to my last slide, please. So I want to just pick up this idea of trust and hope, the phenomenal levels of resilience that you've already heard about were kind of possible if people had hope. And that's a really powerful, um, what would you call it, emotion, characteristic, experience of life. And the things that undermined hope there, therefore were the things that kept people stuck in depression and in hopelessness. So this uh, man who was a, uh, a forced migrant from Iraq said that the process of waiting for, for his permit, a residency permit, limits me from every sense. I cannot integrate, I cannot become an active citizen. This is a psychological violence. In addition, the fake hope that some authorities gave us is a form of violence too. So this man really felt that he'd come to Sweden on false promises and was being subject to what he actually calls violence there. There's another area of um, trust in the Swedish authorities that's quite active at the moment and that came up in a lot of our interviews. And this is a lack of trust amongst people of migrant background in the Swedish authorities. Sweden as a whole is characterized by a high level of trust in uh, statutory and municipal authorities. But a, a, a theme that came up from quite a lot of forced migrants was the idea that the social services referred to as socialen, um, were not to be trusted with one's children. So the quote here is, everyone here is worried of their kids being taken away from them. That's a fear. Kids go to school and you feel like if you say something wrong to the teachers, they might call socialen, the social services, and then your kids will be taken away from you. This is not logical. Why don't you help us when we need to sort out our life and get a house or a job instead of taking our kids away? So this is both a conspiracy theory and a real issue. And it relates to the uh, reforms that we've called for in our final report. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you so much, Hannah. And thank you for bringing up those really critical issues of hope, the lack thereof, um, the dependency issues on, on abusive spouses, and also the issues around trust and the lack of trust and the critical roles all of those play in the integration process and in the trauma recovery process. So thank you for that. We're gonna move on to our final destination country to hear about the experience of uh, experiences from the research in Australia. We're gonna hear from Dr. Kathy Vaughn, who is a senior lecturer and acting head of the Gender and Women's Health, um, Women's Health Unit at Melbourne School of Population and Global Health, and Dr. Karen Block and is, is Associate Director of the Evidence and Child Health Unit in the Center for Health Equity at Melbourne School of Population and Global Health at the University of Melbourne. So Kathy and Karen, over to you. Thanks very much, Dale. Um, and thank you everyone for, for um, sticking with the uh, webinar. Um, before I begin, I would like to, uh, as is customary in Australia, to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation whose unceded lands I'm calling, um, uh, speaking to you today from, um, and to acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded and to acknowledge elders past and present from the Wurundjeri people. I would also like to um, acknowledge uh, Foundation House, who were a fantastic NGO partner to us uh, through the data collection for the project, um, and particularly to uh, really recognise their support and the support of our other NGO partners through this work as we tried to do data collection through the uh, inevitable, in, in unending Melbourne lockdowns. Um, Melbourne, uh, as some of you will know, had... 
uh, very, very long periods in quite strict lockdown over the last couple of years, which has had an impact on our ability to collect data. And importantly, has had an impact on uh, refugee or forced migrants' experiences of violence um, over the last couple of years, which I will mention in a minute. Um, could I have the next slide, please, Dale? Thank you. Um, I, just to give some context, um, because there is often a lot of discussion about Australia's migration system, um, which it, it sort of presents a partial picture of, of how people arrive in Australia as forced migrants. Um, forced migrants arrive in Australia through a, a limited number of pathways. Um, people can arrive on a humanitarian, uh, a special humanitarian visa or a refugee visa, these are people who've been identified through United Nations High Commission for Refugees and who are really very directly relocated from often camps, but not always camps, uh, directly to Australia. Um, so they are coming on a visa from uh, that was granted offshore. People can also apply for a protection visa, a temperature, in number of different types of visas in Australia and they're people who are seeking asylum having already arrived in Australia. Um, most, um, despite uh, often a disproportionate attention paid by governments to people who arrive um, via boat in Australia, in fact the vast majority of people who uh, apply for asylum in, in Australia have come with another valid visa. They may have come on a tourist visa or an international student visa or some other um, way of getting to Australia um, and then usually are put on a temporary visa until their asylum claim is processed. And then people often um, who are forced migrants come to Australia in ways that aren't recognised in the kind of humanitarian response within the country. And they're often people who've come on a partner or prospective marriage or other family visa. And the reason I give this context is one... Um, is to highlight that it is not only people who've arrived by boat and then who've been detained offshore in Australia who are, who are the um, forced migrants we're talking about in Australia. In fact, that's a very small proportion of people um, who arrive in Australia as forced migrants. Um, and that's not to deny the incredible harms that have been inflicted on people who've been in protracted uh, detention uh, offshore in Australia or in detention within Australia indeed. But the visa that someone arrives on in Australia makes a huge difference to the services that they're eligible to access. And it also speaks to the risks that they'll have been exposed to prior to arrival in Australia. So, for example, people who've got had strong connections to services who've been able to access the UN um, High Commission system and be assessed as being refugees and um, come to Australia are quite different to people who've never made it to the front of this magical queue that gets talked about. Um, it affects people's exposure to public people smugglers and the likelihood that they may have trans transited through multiple countries prior to arrival with all the risky uh, events that happen en route, um, which I think was so uh, beautiful, well, not beautifully, so clearly described by Sandra in talking about the experience in Tunisia. So our immigration system really shapes uh, not only the types of uh, people, the types of experiences that people have had um, prior to Australia, or the people that we see arriving in Australia, but it also really shapes forced migrants' um, access to help uh, in terms of their eligibility for various services in Australia. But I think the another important point to raise, and it speaks to all of uh, the findings that we've heard across the five different countries so far, is that our system puts people at risk. It, 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 um, immigration systems cause systematic and structural violence against uh, forced migrants, but they also create conditions that enable greater interpersonal violence. And so many of the people that we interviewed, um, for example, many of the women in this study would talk about the, the interplay between the immigration system and the level of stress in the households that they were living in and how that then became a context in which men would, and it was men that were using violence against usually women, were using a power imbalance in a situation of heightened stress. And so the, the kind of structural environment was creating an environment where interpersonal violence was happening even after arrival in Australia, as Dale has just pointed, spoke to about the, the ongoing nature of violence. If we could have the next slide, thank you. 
Um, I do want to acknowledge Penn, who uh, our uh, colleague who worked on these beautiful graphics and to thank her for the, the lovely wattle, which is Australia's national flower in this um, graphic here, which really speaks to what we learned in Australia about um, what works, I suppose, in terms of services supporting refugee survivors or forced migrant survivors of sexual and gender based violence. And it is important, I think, to talk about what we've learned from service provider interviews and also interviews with survivors themselves about what works. And we did have a lot of data around this in Australia because particularly for forced migrants who've arrived on a humanitarian visa um, or a refugee visa, actually forced migrants have access to a very broad range of services um, that are often quite holistic. And this enables them to then uh, get kids in school, have secure housing and so on, and then be able to process the harms um, and the trauma that they've experienced along the way. And this was in contrast to say some of the survivors we interviewed who had come on a spousal visa or a prospective marriage visa who are not eligible for those same services and therefore really are not able to deal with some of the experiences that they've had um, prior to arrival. So I guess our first point there is around um, the need for safe entry points uh, into countries of resettlement. So certainly when people were able to be directly relocated to um, Australia to not have to go through long perilous journeys um, by sea because it is an island country um, and not be exposed to people smugglers in the same way that that was a protective factor. Um, and that at entry points, if that's in an organised fashion without the kind of perilous border crossings that some of our other colleagues um, in Tunisia and Turkey particularly have talked about, that that is also um, a protective factor in terms of um, what survivors need and how we can provide the other services that I'm going to talk about. There was also a lot of discussion both from workers and um, survivors about the need for holistic responses that they may have been able to access counselling, but that was actually quite useless to them and couldn't be effective if they didn't have safe housing or a base level of financial security so that we, we can't see um, some of the treatment of physical and mental harms that people may have had in isolation from having the day-to-day -day security um, needs met in terms of housing, um, kids' needs and financial security. There was a lot of discussion from our interviewees about services needing to be flexible and being able to respond to the great diversity of survivors' experiences, ranging from um, one-off instances of severe sexual violence that may have happened in the context of flight or, or during conflict, through to women who were still experiencing daily violence from intimate partners or other family members. And that was a very common um, form of violence that the survivors described. Uh, and particularly that the description of uh, intimate partner violence also was related to the COVID context in Australia where um, there was this very strict lockdown. And so for uh, people being locked down in a home that wasn't safe for them, uh, as we've seen around the world. Uh, this had particular impacts on survivors who were also often re-traumatised and had a lot of um, triggering by lockdown because of other instances along their journey where they had had freedom of movement restricted. Uh, we also noted that services need to have effective referral pathways um, staff skilled who are working uh, in working with people with diverse needs, bilingual and bicultural workers and to be trusted by communities. And to do all of this, there's a real need for long-term funding. But I'm going to hand over to Karen to talk about, um, to build on the theme of resilience that we've been hearing from our colleagues in other um, countries. Thank you, Cathy. And um, thank you, Dale. And thank you everyone who's still Still here, it's been a, a long presentation. Um, I'm also speaking to you from Wurundjeri country uh, in Australia, and I'd also like to pay my respects and acknowledge that this is unceded land. Um, so I think a lot of speakers tonight, oh, sorry, it's tonight here, morning for many of you, um, have spoken about the great strength and resilience that survivors um, show. And this, you know, we know that people have suffered horrific instances of sexual and gender-based violence, but it's really important that we, we understand that, um, that people who have survived these experiences are, are much more than their story of SGBV. 
um, people we spoke to and, and service providers also spoke about people's extraordinary um, resourcefulness. Um, also really important to, to, to really recognise that when um, forced migrants come to a country such as Australia um, and, and all the other countries that uh, this research has been done in, they bring with them skills and knowledge and expertise. Um, they, they are, if we can support people who arrive in this way, um, to settle successfully and give them what give them what they need to get over the trauma that they've experienced, then they are enormous um, bring enormous benefits um, to the countries in which they settle. Uh, they're very skilled. Um, they're people who are very skilled at at developing their own social networks that can help them to heal. Um, Sandra, in particular, spoke about and and her research really focused on. Um, the, the role of faith in helping people to, to be resilient and also the role of faith communities. So um, for many of the people that we for many of the people that we speak to, uh, it's not only their 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 faith in terms of their beliefs, um, but also the actual community that um, that rallies around around those beliefs and that has that has a huge effect on supporting people as well. Um, and the other thing I think that really stood out uh, from our uh, interviews with survivors is the enormous hope that they have for the future and also the role that children play in, um, in keeping, them, keeping them determined to be resilient and strong. You know, that we're, often these uh, forced migrant journeys are made um, with the hope that their children will have better lives and we can certainly, as, um, as people trying to support them, help to support that that outcome for them as well. Uh, so I really want, we wanted to sort of finish by emphasising the strength and resilience of survivors, but also make the, the really important point that we can't use um, this fact of their resilience to, to let services or immigration authorities or governments and international agencies off the hook. Um, we all need to be doing um, better jobs at, at supporting people to have safer journeys. Um, and I really can't emphasise enough how, how, as an international community, ensuring that people can cross borders more safely is one of the most the, the most important things that we can do. Um, and we really need to focus on how, on that. That's one way that a lot of sexual and gender based violence can be prevented and and must be prevented. Um, so I'll leave it there and hand back to Dan. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen and Kathy. We are we are actually at time, but. Um, Martin, can you pull up the, the question for the participants? We, um, as I just do the closing here, I know there were other questions. We will try to answer those. I know that some people have been, some of our panelists have been trying to answer the questions already in the Q&A, but we would like you to take just a minute and talk about, give us some responses in the, in the Q&A or in the chat about what is the main priority action that we can take, that you can take for improving the protection of forced migration SGBB survivors. Um, so as I just quickly close this out um, today, if you could take a couple minutes and do that, that would be much appreciated. I wanna thank all of our panelists, Jenny, Saime, Sandra, Lisa, Hannah, Kathy, and Karen. You've done an amazing body of research. I think it is so informative to how we need to move forward as a community, both in those countries of transit, through the movement of protecting and providing services for forced migrants on the move, and in those, and in those countries of destination. And for all of you participants, thank you so much for staying with us, for participating, your questions, your comments, and most importantly, for your ideas, um, if you can, your ideas to response to this question on how we can improve our collective efforts to prevent, mitigate, and respond to sexual and gender-based violence for those who are forcibly displaced. As I mentioned at the beginning of the session, this work is not over. Now is the time for us to take the findings of this research project, disturbing as they are, um, to change what myths take place and ensure that we do it, that we have the wherewithal to do it, that we move forward to make these changes as individuals, as agencies, as communities of practitioners, academics, and donors. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Have a wonderful day. Um, and I think the links for the reports you've seen. <laughs>
Thank you so much.